Thank you all for being here. Um, new colleagues, uh, really new interesting people that we have met the uh, last few days. Thank you, Misuki, Chin Chin. And um, it has been a, really a privilege to be here and see actually what's going on in the world of textiles, but also in the whole uh, communities and involvements. And um, it's, it's actually really, really great to be back after seven years being away. Um, I lived here uh, one year working on the West Kowloon Cultural District competition, um, where uh, in collaboration with OMA. Um, and it's actually something that I really thought was really interesting about the cities is the fact that there is a, there's a really busy life, uh, but that it can really coexist with really peaceful moments if you know where to find them. Um, and let's hope that uh, when the construction is finished, we can still find this kind of type of settings um, in the future. Uh, I've been working for Inside Outside. Um, I started in 2005. Um, and uh, after a period uh, being away, I came back uh, as a partner. And I thought it was interesting to come back. because I think it's a place where um, everything goes through experimentation. Uh, a place where you are allowed to kind of try things out, fail, and uh, get up again and uh, come with a new solution. So, um, and it really, I'm trained as an architect, and it really kind of moved me in between other disciplines, and also I really learned how to escape the rules of architecture, let's say, and, and creating versatile surfaces, surfaces that are both interior and exterior. And we're quite a small team, actually, something like around 15 people, uh, landscape architects, architects, textile designer, fashion designers, anthropologists. And uh, I think what's, um, it's just, in a way, a strength of our team is that the fact that we always have to present to each other and always kind of recheck what we're doing. And that keeps us sharp, sharp in a way. Um, but yet, inside outside, it's not really a, a kind of a new thing. It's actually really linked to modern architecture, uh, where you have you know, huge surfaces of, uh, of glass uh, creating a continuity between inside and outside really linked to that. And, uh, and our interest really lays in the border, let's say, between uh, both worlds. And in that sense, uh, curtains uh, is, uh, is one of those layers. Um, we create filters for, uh, to kind of frame a few, but also through landscape, but also through textiles. Uh, we, uh, I think one of our obsessions is to play with light, how to catch light in a certain way, how to capture the sun. And I'm starting with this introduction just to give, a, because I will go deeper into some projects, just to give an idea of what we do. Uh, revealing an image through light, uh, but also breaking through surfaces that are normally closed, letting the light into a space, like here at the Van Gogh Museum on an exhibition, or uh, kind of exaggerating light by making really small openings um, to, to create dreaming, dreamy effects of floors and, and reflections. And also escaping the borders, I already said, uh, but literally escaping frames, creating new, new frames within the architecture, triggering uh, voyeurism, uh, being able to, to look outside, but also to, uh, to kind of sneak preview through the, an, an entire space, like we did here. Uh, uh, we work with textiles to also kind of make light mysterious in a way. Uh, and this breaking through is also sometimes really literal. Uh, we kind of, uh, this is a, a concrete a surface that actually allowed the artificial light to go out at night. Uh, and uh, a huge crack uh, creating a parking garage uh, in the midst of a car park and bringing light and air into the space and actually creating unexpected moments mm -hmm. Uh, that actually, yeah, you wouldn't expect, uh, expect it to happen. And, um, but also breaking through to create an image, a new image, uh, like these skylights uh, that we made uh, inside of a former, uh, or in an attic in Berlin, uh, where we're actually doing a small architectural intervention. And uh, by making a huge uh, glass surfaces on the roof, we can allow a glass house to to happen inside of it with a landscape around it. So in this case, it's a client that actually loves 
uh, the attic, he doesn't want to change it. So we decided to make a, an insulated glass house inside of his attic. This is in, under construction still. Uh, triggering the unexpected, also visible, let's say, in the reflections that we encourage to happen, uh, that you actually don't know anymore if you are inside or outside, or what is what's exactly what you're seeing, but actually you see two, two plants uh, in front of each other, and reflections that create new type of dimensions, uh, transformations, also a sense of infinity, a deformation of a, of a space, the shimmering, of light, and also tumbling things upside down, allowing, allowing to look into hidden areas, uh, like we did in the Sonnefeld uh, in Rotterdam, in an intervention in, a, in this monument. And these reflections also create uh, a sense of lightness that we'd like to achieve. And you can call it an, an obsession, actually, in a way, uh, this whole <laughs> reflection um, um, uh, materials and actually that we experiment with and this is for example a, a kind of new work that we're doing with the NS with the Dutch railways on new uh, fast trains um, in the, that will go in the future and, uh, and we're really curious how that's going to happen because that's the first time we're actually really doing something stiff kind of not flexible not moving uh, inside of a moving uh, transport so that, that we're curious how that's going to uh, go on and then we use the tracks. Actually, the track and the path are tools that we somehow use in a similar way. We orchestrate with it, we, we intersect, uh, we frame and create a place, uh, define a spot uh, at a certain scale with it, and also invite people in, like this Rothschild Bank in London. Um, and uh, the path can be an efficient connection from A to B, um, like crossing the, this open field and the West Kowloon uh, uh, proposal, but it can also zigzag down the hill, uh, zigzag on a, on a rooftop, like in Taipei Performing Arts Center, that's also still under construction. So you see that actually our work is quite linked with architecture, and we have collaborated a lot with OMA's office, uh, with Rem Kolha's office, uh, with an incredible team always, but What's interesting about it that we have two dimensions in our work. Actually, one that that can go quite fast, like the curtains in a certain moment, but also uh, the curtains also sometimes depend depend on the construction. So it's it can be it can be a project of one year, but it can also last ten years because we're so linked to the pace of architecture. And that makes actually uh, our work uh, really diverse. So th there can be 15 projects running at the same time, but there are really different uh, moments of time in within. And uh, sometimes a line or a path can really be a statement, like we did in this workshop in the Domaine de Bois Boucher in France, where we uh, literally made a, a line ourselves of 1.5 kilometers through a huge estate. And really, how to literally make this line is a really physical task. And it crossed all the all the landscapes that are in that area, um, and that was something that wasn't uh, uh, actually raised up uh, still. So a three-dimensional a path can be th indeed a three-dimensional space, lyrical, like in this Amstel campus, university campus in Amsterdam. Uh, that this movement also creates a certain space where people can stay. And then there's a fascination on materials and the species that we work with. Uh, we experiment with it. Uh, we research on it uh, quite deeply, like in Qatar, in kind of new climates that we have to dive into. Um, you know, research on nurseries, and also how to create extremes between a green surface and a constructed surface, and uh, using green in unexpected ways. Uh, it's also playing with scale, like in the stock exchange, Plaza, and um, I think indeed what uh, kind of also kind of defines our work is that the interior and the landscape and the curtains they're all in a fluid way they kind of intersect and continue. So we see it as a continuity, um, you know, a green versatile surface um, on one side of an exhaust tower and a hanging object also in the Shenzhen Stock Exchange also has a kind of connection to this. 
to this kind of brush material, like we're really testing, okay, what's the DNA of that material and how can we place it out of its context in a way, like we did in this Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart, together with uh, Ben van Berkel. And, uh, and what is the power of the material itself? How can the different aspects of each textile uh, be strengthened, like the shine here of the fall leather and the matte, matte uh, surface um, yeah, of the other, uh, of the, um, yeah, of the different, different types of textiles. And also, um, is there a way to manipulate what you see? Can you give the impression of tactility or softness while it's actually a wallpaper? Um, there's a kind of interesting thing that's going on also is that more and more we are obliged to design fences around parks. And that's, for example, this is in Milan, in Milano, in the center of the city where it, it was required to have a fence. So how to deal with this? And so we came up with a meandering, uh, actually a meandering uh, fence that created spaces for people to sit and to stay, and to bring people together instead of separating two areas. Uh, of course, inspired also by our work. And then using materials in different directions to create shine, like this velour, or create mat, uh, madness, let's say. And where does the material wants to go? What is the structure? And what, what's the best way to, to seal the material, to kind of connect it? And a big part of our, I mean, it's interesting that they're, they're kind of also people with their big interest in anthropology, because actually the work uh, uh, that we do linked to the architects that we work with are worldwide, and it also has to do with, uh, with all the different dusts and domes from different cultures, so how to present on different, in different spaces. And for example, sometimes really renderings are needed uh, to grab a sense, but sometimes a model like this uh, can be enough to really reach your goal and make something clear to the client that will actually be built a few years later. So that's also part of the game. And then this, for example, which is a, a kind of a really three-dimensional curtain that we are uh, realizing in a building from Snoheta in Saudi Arabia, uh, where, where the really the client required a one-to-one -one mock-up, huge thing that is actually a luxury. You don't always have the luxury uh, of a client that really wants to see exactly how it's going to be before it's actually going to be made. So these are interesting parts. Knitting, uh, knitting structures, experiments, the material itself, uh, making contrast between a, between a steel, st stiff structure and a, f a thin, breakable uh, wrapping, like we did here in, in the Luma Foundation in Zurich with, uh, in, a, in an exhibition design with kind of really controversial artwork that are kind of uh, copies of real art. Uh, and that's something you can only do with certain work, of course. Um, but that's something we embrace. And indeed, the yarn, uh, this is actually uh, a work that we did together with Deso. Deso is a, a huge carpet company based in Holland that create, that make carpets for, uh, the, for, for the aviation industry. And we, with them, we made a three-dimensional uh, weaving a material, actually a, a tapestry that is now hanging at the Salic Museum, specially commissioned for it. Um, and then indeed, uh, the liquid floor, how can a floor look like liquid while being stiff? Or how can a drawing uh, from the Middle Ages combined with a Chinese paper cut technique can become a garden uh, until construction? Like we're kind of, uh, the, 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 actually, the medium, and I think that's interesting now that we're in a, in a polytechnic. I don't know how many students there are present, but we really think that really the sketch and the first ideas and the concepts uh, can really be, uh, yeah, as long as you have a resilient idea, and really be made until the until the very end, like you see here in Qatar, in Doha. And kind of ending my introduction, uh, we're inspired with a challenging gravity. Uh, if clients' uh, work is not enormously inspiring, and we did uh, a curtain for a performance of a Greek composer, where we completely were independent of the architecture and really floating uh, in itself, floating in a space, flying, and getting rid of structures. So to start with a project that we we think is uh, for us uh, one of the main projects that show 
how a collaboration indeed of an interior uh, team and a landscape team uh, can be uh, as fruitful as possible. Uh, and this is uh, a Casa de Musica in Porto, it's a cultural house uh, from OMA, uh, in which we ha uh, had to design 11 curtains for all the big stage, for all the stages, rehearsal rooms, and different areas. Um, and uh, where we also were involved in the making of the whole plaza and the space around it. And going back to the material, uh, what's interesting about it is that we're working with travertine here. Um, and we, but we really wanted to make it look as a fluid surface uh, where everything was integrated, undulating around the building, uh, embedded in, with embedded furniture, and looking soft while being this rock in, uh, in its natural way. And with a certain bright color that even in rainy days, it will look positive. Um, and nine of the 11 cur curtains are actually uh, suspended over a really massive corrugated glass. Uh, and in the two concert halls, um, we did a kind of a special curtain that uh, was inspired by the, the Catholic uh, women going to the church with their veils of different, actually black or white. Um, we knotted uh, a net, actually, with a nylon fiber and strips of voile. We knotted this huge uh, curtain, knotted by hand, um, yeah, by indeed like around 17 women for more than 700 hours, uh, to do this, this actually flat curtain. Uh, and what was interesting is that uh, actually the architecture was a corrugated glass that looked like a curtain, and actually our curtains uh, were the architecture in itself. So we kind of changed things around. And you see that here. And the reflection of the corrugated glass also transforms the space. And um, I think I, I call this, this lecture versatile surfaces because it refers, let's say, to the influence of all surfaces. We, uh, when we collaborate, we also look uh, at the entirety. And uh, as you know, indeed, the obsession of, of catching light is also uh, introduced in this project with a golden leaf uh, pellicle uh, applied to the wooden uh, wood panel uh, with a certain uh, pattern, and also the co collaboration with Martin van Seyferen on the selection of the mohair, silverish mohair uh, velour, also captured the light. So you know, we are kind of involved in in all those phases, and then indeed the architecture and the curtain play a game together and sort of suddenly become one. And each space. Was had the specific character uh, because of also because of the curtains, not only but also, and we decided to make them all colorless on purpose, and actually let the light of the stage deep, kind of create the light that was uh, wished by the artist, whatever it would be. And then, yeah, here you see also the softness that we try to introduce in all in all the architectural work. This is a, a let's say a rubber acoustic foam that. Yeah, that, that kind of has a completely another, gives another feeling to the space. And also even aluminum, uh, treating it in a certain way and combining it in its entirety, it makes it look soft. And introducing a smaller scale also by colorful interventions of tiles in two different cultures. The Dutch Delft blue uh, that actually resembled a bit the Portuguese tiles and the more modern version inspired by the typical Portuguese colors. You see the building in perspective. And uh, a jump of scale is actually the, the intervention that we did for the Arts Biennale in 2004. Uh, that um, There was an, inst in, an exhibition inside of the uh, Villa Manin. And um, the curator wanted the exhibition to continue outside. But it's this enormous uh, piece of land. And he, uh, he wondered how could you, he asked us to make a pavilion. And at that time, well, we said, no, we, we're, not, we're not architects. We, we have to think of something else. So we thought of actually um, making something intimate, uh, an umbrella transformed uh, into a personal pavilion that everybody could just take uh, with himself and kind of go through the whole exhibition outside. And they could carry it around and, and also kind of disappear in the way that it reflected the landscape uh, around it. And we made them ourselves. We, uh, there was almost no budget. And we said, OK, well, let's uh, do handwork. And we spent uh, a few days and nights making them. And, um, and it was actually interesting if you connect it to the relation of the architecture that is there. Um, 
uh, yeah, it's actually, it's actually, the architecture is based on the Baroque principles that actually is about the discovery of the linear perspective and the relationship between the fewer and the few, and the few and the fewer. And, and what we, the guests, let's say, the, the guests in the 17th century uh, were observers, but in our case, in the 20th century, the visitor is an active participant. Uh, so, an installation that appears and disappears, catching the light, and sometimes really literally disappeared because it was kind of popular and sometimes also they got lost, <laughs> um, and that really happened. And, um, and this was combined with some reflective circles that, si that kind of worked like signage uh, in uh, the more dark areas of the place. Uh, creating, uh, yeah, actually being able to look really deep into the crowns and uh, creating a six, like a sixth dimension, let's say, downwards. And I think it's interesting to, to tell also um, uh, because of the fact that how you kind of change a, a commission around. They were asking for a built pavilion, and we said, no, we're gonna, we're going to do something that that can that we believe in and can work in our scale, in the scale that we work. Um, and something kind of, I would like to introduce kind of more technical projects for the kind of textile uh, uh, crowd in the, in the room. Um, it's a project that we did for the Central Library in Qatar with OMA, building from OMA. Uh, we worked on the landscape and uh, on the interiors. And actually I will zoom into the, into the Central Library. Uh, it's an education city, a huge uh, development that's kind of quite far now. And, um, and actually the building looked a bit as if it was landed from somewhere else uh, into the site. And we wanted to do something quite minimal with the landscape. And uh, also in the vicinity of the area was kind of uh, many busy and kind of really irregular shaped pro uh, projects going on also in the landscape. So we thought, let's make a simple garden with a simple recipe, a group of circular imprints that were embedded into the soil and kind of in inspired by the landscape from Lanzarote, uh, which is one of the Canary Islands. It's a method used uh, to protect the wine yards from wind and sand. And uh, so also the plants could get closer into the, uh, onto the water level. And uh, we planted them in circles of different sizes and uh, with tolerant, uh, with draft tolerant vegetation. So we had three types, acacias, euphorbias, and agaves. Um, and the idea was also uh, a sustainable one to actually all, only give them water in the beginning, in the first years of their life, of actually well print, uh, planted, the first years, and afterwards leave them without irrigation because they would survive because they are native and that's what that, how uh, is actually their best habitat. So while working on the aesthetic control of this uh, landscape, we also dived into the uh, into a certain um, commission that was actually making the curtain for an auditorium uh, that was actually under a sloping, a sloping uh, ceiling and that was also breaking into a, a, a bridge construction inside of the, of the library. And uh, it was an interesting shape and we, we thought, well, we, we, want to, we want to stay diagonal. We don't want to become like a, a horizontal bucket that's hanging there in the middle of the space. We want to go with that. So that would be really a pity if we do so. But, um, so everybody was really enthusiastic, yes, of course, but we didn't realize a bit, let's say, the stupidity of our idea uh, that uh, this textile had to hang both in horizontal, in a horizontal way, but also in a diagonal way. And, um, and then the research, yeah, because we also had to store them all in, on the upper part. And then re research began. Uh, and this was really interesting because it was together with the, steel, the textile lab of the Textile Museum in Tilburg. And we had a two years intense collaboration on trying to make a textile that would slide in vertical direction. And um, it was a kind of a technical challenge also to use and choose the yarn, the proper yarn that could have this shiny but also smooth, strong, durable. And of course, you have so many requirements, color fast, non-shrinking, but still could move. So. Um, after research uh, time, that actually we came up with a viscosa, the viscosa raffia it's called. It's a natural cellulose uh, that, that's derived from fiber plants, from palm species, actually. And here you see that uh, uh, actually the warp gave the structure uh, 
so that's actually the uh, the horizontal, the, the smaller parts, and um, uh, and and actually uh, the shifting part, the slippery part, was the weft. So uh, and this is uh, you are, this is how the the whole textile was woven in this direction. But of course, we had to hang it in the other direction to be able to go diagonal. And well, this it looks it's quite simple. You say, well, yeah, it, indeed it moves, but it's a certain size. We're talking about 700 meters of textile being woven to create a curtain of 100 meters at the end. So it's kind of uh, it's a big thing. And we we were inspired by the actually the beautiful nights of full of stars that we saw in the desert and in that area before it was uh, more built. And we we took let's say let's say the cosmos as a as a theme a theme and uh, with with proximity of dots and we kind of also recreate that, and um, and the, what's also important to notice indeed it was a, a shakar, so it was actually a, a damask, so there was a really white side on the outside and a really uh, dark blue uh, side on the inside, and the the architects were really happy because they had a really white interior, so it melted a bit with their interior, and uh, uh, and inside of the auditorium there was this more intimate space. So yeah, we, we started, we made uh, prototypes and we went to the clients and uh, they really thought it looked like a potato sack in the first place. So we're like, uh, no, I don't, you know, also the shaker of the was and this is really, it looks really like a vegetable sack. And uh, so we were really, we went there in a really proud way that, like, yeah, we solved the problem. But of course, hard to mention. So we really had to structure it um, much more, and uh, creating every 20 centimeters, we had to uh, let's say create a new uh, a new line, let's say like a beam that gave it structure. Uh, and that's, that's what you see here to make it stiff, so like it rips actually in a certain rhythm, and also some extra diagonals to to help the structure to move in a diagonal way. So it was this whole mathematic actually uh, solution. And yet, keeping the shine, keeping the elegancy, getting rid of the feeling that was uh, first there, and, and saying, yeah, it's, it's also, it's going to be a royal, also, in a way, curtain. And here you see it in process. Um, but once, yeah, actually, by doing this, we were still not happy. We said, well, something is, is missing. It looks a bit like a man's shirt. Somehow, it's like it has a, a kind of repetitive rhythm. And we were inspired by the, the, the astrolabs that we saw in the His Doha's Historic Museum. And uh, that also has a relation to the measurement of the planets. So we actually superimposed, in a bigger scale, uh, a graphic uh, translation of that um, to the curtain. So you go from it from our drawings uh, of the technical kind of the what how we want all the pieces to be soon and how the whole connection. But then it, in the textile museum, it has to be translated into their weaving programs, and that's also a really intense labor phase. And I think that's an interesting part because then you say, okay, we're almost there. But then in the weaving starts, and then it's translated into this new program that you have to check and check and check. So it's really labor intensive for both parties, for the textile museum and for us, because we have to be really sure that it all goes completely right. And this is like after uh, important time. So there we are with our really beautiful test. And we have to, because it's a cellulose, a uh, natural fiber, we had to impregnate it for, to, to become fire retardant. It's a, a public building. And um, when it was impregnated, the whole, actually this cellulose suck all the liquid of the impregnation. So it, it really got, you know, it deformed quite a lot. And like a sponge, it really took up all the, all the liquid. So we had to, and it was actually also uh, kind of really in a huge collaboration with, with Textile Museum, we made this, they made these wooden frames to dry the textiles, all these you know, kind of huge meters of textile in a, for a long time to be able to it keep, its, keep its shape. And um, yeah, so this is the process. And then it goes, then you are there, but then it goes to the production company. We collaborate a lot with Geritz, which is a German production company. Here they are being uh, transported and with the kind of whole the recipes of the production. 
we communicate and, and check and go to see how it's evolving. And here you see a process. And this was a temporary one hanging in the space. And now, yeah, this is already kind of starting installation. And then we go with all the teams, both Gerits, uh, both Instalasa, we all go to hang that curtain with a huge team and doing like last minute kind of fine tuning on spot to get it right until the end. And it's not open yet, but let's see how the public will react. And on another note, uh, uh, I would like to tell this story because it's kind of a more a, a political uh, a curtain that kind of changed something into a space. Um, and it was a, a building, uh, the House of Kunst Museum is a building from Tro Trost from the 30s and uh, with beautiful floor plans, a great composition of rooms and really elegant and classicistic uh, with a great central hall, the Mittelhalle. But he, yet the roof light, you can, you can see it here, you have the swastika signs. Um, visible, and uh, it was a place where Hitler used to speech. And, uh, and actually, after the war, everything that reminded uh, the museum of their history was stripped or covered, uh, was undone. And um, this middle hall is a traffic space. It's really actually in the middle of all the exhibitions. And uh, the, the curator at that time, or actually the director, asked us, uh, to create a space where that would be multiflex, multifunctional, to you make a curtain that could be, can be projected on, that can change of different positions. And uh, it's interesting because, of course, uh, there's something that we see a lot lately that we're commissioned by museums to do these type of spaces. Uh, and it's also, it has to do with the fact that uh, museums have to get money in, cert in a certain way. So these spaces allows them to create events and do kind of different actions inside of it. So actually, we, there's like three now, actually, what we're working at the moment on museums to make kind of multifunctional, uh, flexible spaces. Uh, so what we did is actually create a curtain that was not obedient to the architecture at all. So we, with this classicistic and kind of open uh, space, um, uh, the, the director, Chris Derkon, at that time said uh, that he really wanted to, you know, get the real architecture out again and get rid of these layers and, and hiding the story of the past. We're, we're in the future. We're now, you know, we're about the future. We're, what are we um, hiding? And we have to face it. So we, we made a curtain that actually cut the symmetry uh, of the space entirely, kind of making it another, uh, kind of another uh, experience and really... Yeah, being there if you want, kind of allowing it to, to still happen, but also really transforming it um, and respecting also its original naked space, but also really inter intervening with it. And it, the material was a, a, a special material that also you can project on. So it really needed to be multimedia and multifunctional and all those things that are required nowadays in museums darkening and defining the space and also revealing the beautiful floor plan and being proud of the building, uh, also showing exits. And actually the curtain functioned also as a wall in a way, as a museum wall. And here you see it in a stored, in a stored direction, in a stored way. And on versatile surfaces, um, when we collaborate on, this, on the Seattle Public Library, with OMA, uh, it was interesting that there was a really narrow sidewalk around. Actually, there was not much space around it. And uh, we as landscape architects as well, we, uh, we found ways to get, uh, in a way, get involved. And we had many discussions with the municipality and we got the chance to influence the choice of the native trees on the path of the, around the, let's say, on the path of the Seattle Library. And uh, we kind of tried to enlarge the green areas through reflection of the facade uh, by enlarging it by to making it really uh, voluminous uh, while actually being small in a way. When you go there, you see that's actually not quite big. And also bringing the green inside of the uh, Seattle Library and uh, also going actually using it as a routing all the way until the top. Um, and we did this project uh, in, with using actually carpets, tufted carpets, created by, um, actually produced by a Danish company called EGE, kind of known carpet company. 
and we used own photographs of plants. And what's interesting that a few years earlier we had an exhibition in storefront where we printed the carpets, and that's way much easier, let's say, to reveal an image because you know a printed image has 257 uh, or 275 colors, different colors that you can show. But tufted, you only have eight. So the, the challenge here was in that time actually, because now you can do more. But uh, so the challenge was how to keep a depth in this image how to keep it uh, interesting and intricate. And that was actually the, the, the whole job that we uh, had to do. And um, it also gave a certain scale to the space. Uh, it also defined spaces in where to sit, uh, where, to, you know, where to walk. So it really was used instead of a, a kind of a signage saying a resting area. And um, it was also what's interesting of a public library is that it's a really open public space, right? So everybody's allowed um, in. So uh, homeless, but uh, groups of kids, uh, um, drug addicts. That was really a problem in Seattle at that time. So we really had to make a, a, a kind of a bulletproof carpet, a vomit-proof carpet, let's say, that you could really kind of clean and, and maintain all the way. So actually, and still, it's there, so we sometimes hear from people, yeah, or checking it out, or we have the chance, and still the quality of the, this Danish company is really good, and it's still there. And also we introduced one garden inside, it really came in, literally. And going up, with continuing with this bright yellow color, uh, we also um, f kind of, you know, encountered this cushion-like acoustic ceiling that we uh, finished with a light gray, color that took all the colors of the surrounding, actually. So, uh, and uh, you know, the green went into the heart of the auditorium, into the building. And this is a, a project that was, uh, that started, it's called the Solar Curtain. It, it actually started in 2002 when Petra, together with a doctor and, uh, um, and a group of people uh, kind of joined in a competition. Uh, called um, uh, Architect Architecture for Humanity, and it was actually to design uh, uh, something for art AIDS clinics, something related to AIDS in Africa, to help uh, beat uh, uh, the AIDS problem at that time. And uh, they came up with a, a textile with uh, photovoltaic uh, uh, cells in it, uh, in a circular shape to be able to also to move it, that could actually function uh, to kind of create energy and also give shade. It's, like it's really like a mobile sub-Saharan uh, clinic, let's say, HIV clinic. And uh, you see some tests. Um, at that time, they didn't, didn't, didn't win the project. And um, meanwhile, of course, this whole, uh, this whole technique evolved uh, it was introduced in fashion and in textile. And then one day, uh, the textile museum came to us uh, and said, hey, we, we, had a, we have a, a budget to do some research and development. Do you have any curtain or anything you would like, or any textile you would like to uh, kind of uh, develop? And of course, the first thing that came up was, yeah, the solar curtain that was, was once an idea, but never realized in a proper way. So we started a collaboration. This is a building from Textile Museum. We right away kind of photoshopped it on, on the museum just to check uh, uh, some dimensions. What are we going to do? What is the scale of the test? And uh, uh, we kind of experimented with different, uh, different uh, weavings and different type of textiles also to think, are we going to use soft or hard cells? And actually, um, uh, we concluded that, that uh, of course, uh, uh, knitting would be the best thing to do because uh, by knitting you have, an, uh, you have actually one thread. It could be elastic. Of, this is an elastic textile, of course, and actually out of one single um, thread that could create a circuit also and enable conductivity. And uh, on this photovoltaic cells, we collaborated with an office called Solar Fiber that are specialized in that. And they actually advise us to use a hard cell to make it, to give also structure to the whole textile. Because the idea, of course, is can we make a curtain, an outdoor curtain in so many, I mean, we're working in so many hot countries as well, but actually in, in also in Europe, it could work that besides giving shade, also creates energy. 
So that's actually the, uh, the ambition that we had. And um, so indeed, these heart cells had to somehow be, had to be connected, and we made it three-dimensional. We needed, or uh, the still same knitted uh, with a knitting machine, these three-dimensional pockets where the cells could be placed. And they had to be in a certain angle, of course, to, to catch the sunlight. And the angles differ from left, uh, let's say, the Netherlands, and right in Doha, for example. So we had to research what's the best angle and what's the best thread to use. So uh, quite soon, uh, it was clear that the transparent monofilament was uh, really suitable. Um, this monofilament is used actually for fishing industry uh, and, uh, and also aeronautic, aeronautic purposes. But it's actually really ideal because it's transparent. So, you know, it also, that's an important part of it. We wanted also light to come through. And it's really, you can use it in outdoor spaces and it's really strong and it can, yeah, and, and it doesn't stretch. And this, this monofilament was combined with an acrylic yarn, uh, yeah, with more supple yarn that could be uh, knitted. So um, this whole process we went through with Textile Museum in their kind of uh, both, it's an initiative of us both together, let's say, that's what's beautiful about it. It's our kind of uh, uh, an old idea that actually was completely embraced by the Textile Museum. Okay, let's, let's try to do this. Together. And of course, what is the con best conductive yarn to use? So we experimented with copper and also with stainless steel, but copper was kind of really hard and really also broke and, and well, bro broke many needles, but also the textile. Um, and in that sense, the stainless steel was better, was thinner, more flexible, but was less conductive, so less efficient. So, and in actually in this process, we're still, uh, we, we managed you know, to do a sample, also how, how to connect um, both sides, how to, what's the space between the different cells, how to, you know, also how, how to maximize the conductivity when you fold the, the also when you fold the fabric. So you see that uh, they alternate each other to be able to fold, so each cell kind of alternate each other. And um, this is how it could fold, be folded. And here you are, we are met with the first sample, translucent, with the cells. And um, at, at what, how, where we are now is actually that it has a potential of 24 watts per square meters uh, of curtain. And it's actually enough to charge a phone in 15 minutes. So that's where we are. But of course, the next step, can we get it into the scale of architecture with a certain transformer? And how can we do that? And that's actually still open. So who knows uh, we, uh, yeah, how we ca can continue. And actually, this morning, I was completely impressed by this. I mean, yesterday, we had a, indeed a presentation of the company of research and textiles in Hong Kong. But uh, we were amazed. Indeed, both Errol and I from Textile Museum and I were like, wow, here's a lot going on on research in that sense, and definitely a place to collaborate. And afterwards, we actually uh, we were asked to, to, be, to join an exhibition in Autostadt in Wolfsburg. Uh, called Design Display, uh, with the objective to look to everyday design objects uh, in a different way and focus on the way that design has a relation to its environment and to communal lives as well. I would like to end this lecture with a project important to us um, because it actually captures most of our, our curtain or textile work. Uh, Ole Baumann, which uh, was the former director of the Architecture Institute, asked us to design something beautiful, related to beauty, for the Dutch Pavilion and in 2012 in the Architecture Biennale. And we said, beauty, but that's something, we never make beauty our assignment. That's something we can do. We need a technical, we need a certain uh, function that we're not going to do, we're not artists. We're not going to do something just for something that we think that's beautiful. Or, so um, we had all kind of uh, sessions and discussions. And then we said, you know what, we make a statement. Let's do something, uh, let's reuse this vacant building in its naked way and with a really economic, relatively simple uh, intervention. Literally with three elements, a bicycle chain, uh, textiles, and a few motors. How can we make a space? And um, the, the context is the, this pavilion from Rietveld from 1955 or 54, around. And, uh, and what's interesting about these pavilions in Venice is that they're, they're mostly, they're empty, right? They're just used in sporadic uses, uh, forms, and actually 
uh, it's a, you know it's a, it's a house of art and performance and debate when it's activated, but actually a really silent monument when there's nothing. So uh, we wanted to to really do a in simple intervention that would really activate the space and could be, could be used uh, more often. So the first thing that we did is to strip all the all the light um, kind of uh, uh, blinds and, and to, to take them out to actually let the light go inside of the space because it was kind of really uh, seduced um, to, to connect to the outside world and also to expand the limits of this free space, you know, freeing the space also from its museum-like function. And, uh, but how could we reset a space completely? How could we transform it into a circular space or rectangular or diagonal, irregular space? And of course, a curtain is a, a really uh, kind of strong tool to achieve an effect of movement. And, uh, and we actually could be able to reset the space with one single gesture. And we calculated uh, kind of each position that could be a really recognized, kind of recognizable space. So the, uh, in, in, in 12 positions, um, and constantly going through a loop on this space and really creating multiple rooms, uh, showing the potential, let's say, of the architecture itself. And uh, every position uh, uh, stayed for a few minutes and, and the whole loop was uh, it endured 20 minutes. Uh, and actually the 12 positions also uh, symbolize the 12 hours of the day, the 12 hours of the night. So we kind of um, had the plan also to exaggerate, to say, the movement and, and transition between the textiles. We used three different types of textiles. Uh, one pink velvet, a translucent black voile, and a translucent white voile. And the black voile, what it does in front of the of the pink is that it intensifies the color, and the white wall softens the color. And, he, and we also introduce a big a transparent window, but also an opaque obstruction uh, into the space. And um, and uh, third textile is the fall leather, reflecting the colors in its surroundings. Um, so there were three pieces of textiles of a total of 48 meters and uh, five meters high, and. The interesting thing is, that, of course, it's a monument, so we had to hang a rail on a lattice structure that was actually supporting the glass before, and how to do that. Uh, so we collaborated with Geritz, our German uh, uh, team, and, um, and they kind of really came up with really good solutions, beautiful solutions, that it became so nice that we were like, wow, we don't want to hang a curtain anymore, actually. It's like, <laughs> it's like a robotic, aesthetic kind of uh, image and a low-tech connection, but in a beautiful way. And uh, yeah, here you see the bicycle chain um, and the wheels and the motors. And uh, also a way to kind of get light more deep into the building. We kind of made these constructions to redirect the, the light inside the pavilion. Um, so the, the light from west to east was a natural one, but the light from east to west was enforced, forced into the uh, space by these tilted mirrors and creating a, kind of really a play of shadows and light. And uh, what was interesting is that, well, we had the construction, we did some tests, and actually it was the, this German company so perfect that they, they made this, you know, it's a bicycle chain, but they made this perfect, zzz, like it really kind of zoomed away, and we were like, no, this, is, this has to be low-tech. So actually, having lunch with the team that worked on it, we, kind of, we asked if they, uh, you know, what, what they were doing besides installing installations. And one of them said, I'm a composer of modern, uh, class of modern music, modern, modern classical music. So we asked him to come up with something that would make sound because it was just too, too uh, silent. And so he, he really came up with his fingers that he took just from his atelier and that it, when it passed some, through def different areas, you can see here some things hanging, it, it created a sound. So this was kind of brought into the installation. So every position stays 90 seconds, and filtering the movements behind it, playing also with the, the space, really taking possession of the space, or actually also creating encounters with, with certain curves, sharp curves, intimacy, opening up and creating large rooms, also small ones, and really reshaping and playing with its uh, context, allowing long views, and really with different moments. 
of uh, positions, and I would just like to show a bit of a, a moving image. Well, actually, unlike a museum, we didn't filter the light. We didn't guide the visitors. Um, we didn't place objects, actually. We, we, we kind of gave the building a new sense of scale and color and light and texture. And the exhibition also deals with time, actually, because in a world actually where everything goes fast and you have to move quickly, visitors really had to take the time to experience this 20-minute intervention. People came, they came back, for all times to discover something new. So we kind of demanded that, that actually it works um, in an interesting way. And the fact that it's a, a moving object frees us from static architecture. From our, like, yeah, look what architecture can do. Um, but yet, it, while being a textile, it really expresses lots of architectural language. But it, it, it's about transparency and opaqueness, about color and colorness, about vertical and horizontal divisions, but also fuse and obstruction and reflection and absorption. Many people asked, why pink? And we said, well, because it's really so not Rietveld to do. And it also gave a certain glow and shine to the walls, to the white walls.
what's actually interesting also about it is actually that it united people, but also separated people because of the movement. So sometimes you were in a group and you were separated by two. And also encouraged, it encouraged play. And I think play, I thought it was really great that yesterday the word play was introduced also to some of the speakers. I think play is a really important tool that we use also in our work. Um, and what's finalized is, I think, um, you know, normally we work with architects, living architects, <laughs> let's say, on projects. And in this case, the architect had long passed away. But nevertheless, we, we started a conversation, let's say, with architecture and gave it a creation, let's say, a new, a new life. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for sharing with us creative ways to connect inside and outside and, of course, places. Thank you.